Welcome to First Worship at First United Methodist Church in Florence, Alabama. We're so glad you decided to worship with us today. Please join me in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Defend your church from all false ideas and give to your people knowledge of your truth that we may enjoy eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're beginning a new sermon series on second chances. We all make mistakes and we need a fresh start. I constantly ask for forgiveness for my repeated failures, hoping for another chance to do better. One of my go-to prayers is simply, O oh God of new beginnings and second chances, here I am again. In this three-week series, we're going to explore the power and beauty of second chances. Today, we'll begin with the familiar story known as the parable of the prodigal son. Let's begin with some context. The 15th chapter of Luke begins this way. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. The scribes and Pharisees avoided interacting with tax collectors and sinners at all costs. No self-respecting rabbi would ever associate with these undeserving characters. The fact that Jesus not only interacted with them, but sat down with them over a meal was offensive to the other religious leaders of his day. In response to their resentment, Jesus offers three parables. In the first parable, Jesus describes a shepherd with a hundred sheep, one of which strays from the rest of the flock. Jesus says the shepherd leaves the other 99 to search for the one that is lost. When the shepherd finds it, he rejoices, asking his friends and neighbors to join him in celebrating because he's overjoyed to recover that one sheep. Jesus says there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't see the need for repentance. In the second parable, Jesus introduces a woman who loses one of her 10 silver coins, a coin worth a day's wages for a laborer. She lights a lamp and searches every nook and cranny until she finds it. Like the shepherd, she invites her friends and neighbors to celebrate with her. Again, Jesus describes how the angels rejoice in heaven every time a single sinner repents. Then in the third parable, Jesus describes a rebellious son who asks his father for his share of the inheritance, runs off to a far country, and loses his fortune in wasteful living. Dejected and ashamed, the son returns to his father, hoping to get hired as a servant after all, he's no longer worthy of being his son. Not only does the father receive him as a beloved son, but he also throws a party for him. An older brother who has remained faithful to his father refuses to join the celebration. And then the story concludes, Then the father said to the older brother, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. In response to the criticism of the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus delivers the stunning message that God forgives every repentant sinner and lovingly welcomes them home, even tax collectors and sinners. Everybody gets a second chance, but there's more to these three stories for us to explore. There are major problems with these parables. The first parable is utterly unrealistic. No responsible shepherd would ever leave 99 sheep vulnerable to predators to go off and find one. Losing one sheep versus losing 99 is a no-brainer. Lose the one, cut your losses, and move on. Second, these three parables seem to lack literary parallelism. In the first parable, it's one sheep out of a hundred. In the second, it's one out of 10. And in Jesus' third story, it's one son out of two. And the father doesn't even go out looking for the lost son, 
like the shepherd did or, or sweep every nook and cranny like the woman. If we think of these as three separate stories, these are parables about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. As a result, we think these are stories about us. But let's look at Luke's description of what Jesus did. It says, so Jesus told them this parable, as if it's one. All three stories are part of one parable. Viewed as three different parables, they become about lost sheep, lost coins, and lost sons. The focus is on that which is lost. When viewed as a single parable, it becomes the parable of the loving Father. The focus is on God's searching, unconditional, forgiving, and restoring love. It's a parable about God's gracious nature. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. The first thing to notice is the younger son's request. He asks his father for his inheritance while his father is still alive. In Middle Eastern culture, he might as well have said, Father, I want you dead. A traditional Jewish patriarch would have struck the boy's face and kicked him out of the household. However, in Jesus' story, the father grants his son's request. What the younger son receives is no small amount. This family is wealthy. They have livestock, servants, and a large banquet room that can host the entire community. The boy had to sell his part of the family farm to get cash for his new life. Since Jewish law forbade the sale of an inherited property before a father's death, his father would have to authorize the deal, adding even more insult to his injury. After liquidating the property, probably at a discount, the younger son packed up and ran off to find the life he dreamed of apart from his father, family, and community. His new life didn't pan out as the younger son hoped. We don't know how long it took him to waste all that money, because it was a lot of money, but eventually it was all gone. With nothing left to live on, he faced difficult choices. Jesus described it this way. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. Some scholars think he was looking for a job to replenish his wealth because the law said if he came home with enough money to repay his father, his father would have to forgive him. But times were hard and jobs were few. Slopping pigs wasn't a viable plan for recovering the kind of cash he lost. He needed a different strategy. Jesus said, but when the younger son came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. We would be mistaken to think the younger son, when he came to himself, that it was a, a form of repentance. It's not a true confession at all. Kenneth Bailey argues that the scribes and Pharisees would recognize the source of the younger son's words. He's echoing Pharaoh's fake confession, trying to get Moses to call off the plagues sent to punish Egypt for keeping the Israelites in bondage. In Exodus chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, we read this. Pharaoh hurriedly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Do forgive my sin just this once and pray to the Lord your God that at the least he removes this deadly thing from me. Likewise, the younger son is unrepentant and merely trying to manipulate his father into letting him come home. 
to come home, not only would the son need his father's forgiveness, but he needed the forgiveness of the people in his village too. Bailey notes the Jerusalem Talmud prescribed certain punishment for any person who lost his inheritance to the Gentiles. It was the Ketzatza ceremony. This shaming ceremony was simple. When a wayward son returned home, the whole community ran out to the edge of town, shouting his name and saying, we cut you off from your people. One of the village leaders would take a large earthenware jar filled with burnt corn and nuts, symbolizing the destruction the prodigal had brought upon his village, and then throw the pot at his feet, formalizing the breaking of ties with the boy forever. Children would mock the offender and throw rocks at him, sometimes severely injuring him or, in extreme cases, killing him. If he survived the Ketsatsa ceremony, no one from the village could ever interact with him again, including his father. The younger son would have known about the Ketsatsa ceremony, but he went home anyway. Jesus said, So he set off and went to his father, but while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. The father ran to his son to get to him before the villagers could carry out the Ketsatsa ceremony. He didn't want anyone to harm his son, so he pulled up his robe to run as fast as possible. Now, only little girls pulled up their robe to run, but this esteemed father humiliated himself and ran like a girl to protect his wasteful son from an angry mob. When he gets to him, he embraces him and he kisses him for all the villagers to see. His forgiveness will be evident, and so they too must forgive his son. There will be no Ketsatsa ceremony on this day. Whether it was exhaustion from the trip home or starvation from not having eaten for quite a while, the younger son fails to grasp what's happening. And we read, Then the younger son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Maybe the boy was still trying to earn his father's forgiveness, but it was his father's love that restored the son to the family and to the village, and that was cause for the whole town to celebrate. Meanwhile, the father's other son, the older brother, returns from working the land and he hears the music. He asks a servant about what's happening. The servant says his brother has come home and his father is throwing a party in his honor. If you haven't made the connection yet, this party is just like the parties already pitched by the shepherd over finding his sheep and the woman recovering her lost coin. These three parties represent the parties that take place in heaven every time a sinner repents. When the father hears his oldest son refuses to join the party, which by the way is a slight to his father, equally as offensive as the younger son's shameful actions up to that point, the father goes to him. Then the father said to his oldest son, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This statement is a word of grace for the scribes and Pharisees to whom Jesus is telling these stories. God celebrates their place in the kingdom of God too, and they will always have access to God's blessings. The only way they miss the party is if they refuse to come. So Luke 15 is not a collection of three parables as most assume. It's a single parable about our God who is a loving and gracious Father. Our God is like a crazy shepherd recklessly looking for one sheep, a frantic woman desperately sweeping her house in search of a lost coin, and a lavishly loving father. He humiliates himself to show us how special we are to him. 
So if you're here today and you find yourself in need of a second chance or a third chance or even a millionth chance, all you need to do is come home to this loving, forgiving and restoring Father. Your loving Father is waiting to embrace you and kiss you as if you have never left. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Yeah.